of man. And when you reflect back on it, it probably was even greater than I could comprehend today. With a scant five months to spare, NASA has met President Kennedy's goal. America has gained preeminence in human spaceflight. Yet it's only the beginning. Lunar exploration and science are Apollo's new mission, and the program will land 10 more men on the moon to fulfill it. That's one small step for man. We're in the viewing room at the Mission Control Center in Houston, watching the terminal phase of, of that flight and the, the landing itself on the moon. I was telling Neil not to land because we were next. <laughs> but he did a great job. Every Apollo mission starts the same. Three men in a capsule sit atop the giant Saturn V rocket waiting for its monstrous engines to propel them off the Earth. The three-stage Saturn V stands 363 feet tall and at launch weighs more than six million pounds. Its three stages generate nearly nine million pounds of thrust. It is the largest rocket ever flown. Five, four, three, two, one, zero, all engines running, commit, liftoff. When Apollo 12 leaves pad 39A on the second moon landing mission, the Saturn V proves its mettle. 36 seconds after lifting off in a rainstorm, lightning hits the rocket and waylays the crew's control panel. Yeah, I don't know what happened here. We had everything in the world drop out. I'm not sure if you get hit by lightning. 16 seconds later, as if to confirm Commander Pete Conrad's theory, a second lightning bolt strikes the rocket. Command module pilot Dick Gordon watches his entire electrical system shut down. The moment of the lightning strike, the reverse current relays did their job and shut down the fuel cells. So we were not receiving any electrical power from the, from the fuel cells, which was our main source of, uh, of electrical energy. Fortunately, at that time, the batteries were on the line for the launch itself, so we had electrical power, and, and uh, that, that really saved us from automatic abort. 13 Saturn V rockets fly during Apollo, including every moon mission. Although anomalies occur, no Saturn V ever fails. I think I see my crater. Hey, baby, I'm not sure. Including Apollo 12s. A major goal of the mission is to execute a pinpoint landing in an area called the Ocean of Storms. So NASA said, we're going to demonstrate this by picking a certain crater, and then we'll uh, send you there. And the crater we're going to pick is the one that has Surveyor 3 in that landed inside this crater some 33 months earlier. And we landed, and the first thing Pete did when he got out was go around and look and see if Surveyor was in that crater. Boy, you'll never believe it. Look what I see sitting on the side of the crater. The old Surveyor, the right? old Surveyor, yes, sir. <laughs> Does that look neat? It can't be any further than 600 feet from here. We have a good shot of you there, Pete. Live television from the moon is now in color. Okay, Houston, I'm going to move the TV camera now. But the achievement is short-lived when Alan Bean accidentally points the camera at the sun and burns out its video tube. Pete and I didn't know that, and so when it burns out, we're standing around not knowing why. Now, the people on the ground knew immediately why, but they never told us. They never said, you pointed it at the sun, it's ruined forever. Al, we have a pretty bright image on that yeah, TV. Could you either move it or uh, stop it down? That's as far as it goes, Houston. How does that look to you? No, it still, still is the same, Al. Big disappointment to all of us and everyone on Earth 
Someone told me one day, they said, there's one thing good about it that came out of it. We used to have discussions that maybe we shouldn't have a TV. They said, after your mission, <laughs> never had that discussion anymore. Everybody agreed we needed TV. NASA closes out the 60s by landing humans on the moon. Not once, but twice. The third attempt comes to be known as NASA's most successful failure. Okay, yes, we've had a problem here. That's one small step for man. It's pretty indelible. I remember sitting in my parents' bedroom in front of the old black and white zenith. It was truly an incredible moment, and I knew that I was witnessing something that was absolutely a turning point in human history. One, 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 die up, leave for mankind. Apollo 13, the third planned moon landing. Commander Jim Lovell's second trip to the moon. This time, he'll not only orbit the lunar surface, but also leave his footprints in its powdery dust. Uh, Houston, we've had a problem. But instead of describing a lunar landscape, Lovell finds himself halfway to the moon, talking with mission control about his dying command module. Main B bus undervolt. Roger, main B undervolt. Stand by 13, we're looking at it. Electrical power is disrupted and readings in the capsule and at mission control don't jibe. Then Lovell sees something out his window. Now look to me, you're looking out the uh, hatch, so we are venting something. We are, uh, we are venting something out uh, into the uh, into space. The explosion of an oxygen tank in the service module has damaged several key systems. The astronauts must scour 24 instruments, 40 alarm indicators, 71 lights and 566 switches to regain control of their spacecraft. With the loss of oxygen, because we used oxygen to produce electricity, all of our electrical power would quit. And when that happened, because we controlled our engine by means of electrical power, we'd lose the entire propulsion system. And so, you know, essentially uh, it, took a, it took a while for the, all that to sink in that it dawned on me that we were in very serious, serious trouble. The crew of Apollo 13 never gets the chance to land on the moon. They can only slingshot around it and, with their lunar module Aquarius as their lifeboat, hope to make their way safely back to 